Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be back with you all again. Um, I think many of you have probably struggled this week the same way that the rest of our world has, and that is many of us are a lot less social. We're a lot less connected. And I think uh, one of the challenges that I've experienced with that is feeling the added weight to be laboring in prayer for our church family and to be um, faithful with the Lord in bringing requests and needs and thanksgiving into His presence. And so this morning, we're going to consider prayer. We're going to look at really a theology of prayer. And I hopefully, uh, I, I hope for you that it will be encouraging. I know for me, uh, one of the challenges I have with prayer is I always feel like I don't pray enough. I feel like my prayers are shallow sometimes. Or um, if you're like me, when you get into prayer, half the time you feel like you're battling just to pay attention like to what you're saying. You're halfway through a sentence and all of a sudden you're thinking about what you got to do with your kids or you're thinking about what you need to pick up on your next Walmart run. Or noise happens in the house and you're, and you're wondering what's going on somewhere else in the house and, and it's so easy for something to come in and just grab your attention and, and take it away from the Lord. And so even right now, I think it's good that we start a sermon on prayer by praying. So let's do that together. Lord, help us with our minds and attention to consider the text before us. Uh, I pray that you would teach us this morning through your Holy Spirit. Father, help those that are um, struggling with sickness, struggling with fear. I ask for those that are struggling with uh, financial pressures, uh, those that are feeling the stress in their home relationships. Father, I pray for all of these and ask that you would uh, give strength, that you would give um, an ability for us to battle the spiritual tensions in our life with grace and with strength. May it help to uh, give your people the ability to honor your son in these little tests of uh, trustworthiness and faithfulness. And this morning, Lord, again, we ask for your grace to be upon us that we might see clearly the scripture before us, be encouraged by it, and be more faithful. Amen. As you look in the text of scripture, again and again, God's people are called to pray. We're called to pray without ceasing. And you're like, man, strike one. I, I cease all the time. I, there's so many times I'm not in a spirit of prayer. And, and then you look at other passages and see Christ praying with this like deep emotion and passion. You're like, man, when I pray, I feel like it's a laundry list and it's not very deep and meaningful like Jesus. Strike two. And then you get to other prayers like by Paul and it's like, like deep theological prayers and they're meaningful. And you're thinking, man, strike three. I'm just, I'm just a loser when it comes to prayer. Let me just tell you that that failure and that guilt is, is easy, I think, for teachers and leaders to leverage But if we're honest, even in Acts, when the church is beginning, there's this social pressure by by needs, real deep spiritual and financial needs of the early church. And the apostles actually have to say, we are not the ones to take care of this because we need to spend time in this scripture teaching and studying and in prayer. And so they have these, these two needs that take up their time and literally they're unwilling to stop praying or working in the word in order to take care of widows. How important is prayer for the early church? And if you're like me, you're feeling like you're on strike 18. Like there are so many ways in which we fail. The scriptures don't treat prayer though in a way that adds guilt. The way the scripture leads us to think about prayer actually motivates and energizes us to pray and doesn't tell us how badly we're doing, but continually the apostle and others hold in front of uh, God's people good example after good example after good example. Um, and, and so let's let's find one of those examples. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul gives this prayer for, for multiple reasons, but one of them is, is what we want to do, and that is to understand how better to be filling our lives with meaningful, rich prayer Because in this time of apartness, there is something that we can do for one another, and that's pray. And so so my my desire is that in this passage, you would find renewed energy, that there would be this sense of renewed joy and understanding so that when you come to the Lord in prayer, uh, there's a freshness and an excitement and uh, maybe an ability to endure and to get rid of distractions and that you'll feel comforted and encouraged and find hope as you come before the throne of grace. So when we look in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is opening for us his prayer for the Ephesians. It's actually the second time he's done this. 
So he's building this example of prayer again and again. When you come to chapter 3, he says in verse 14, for this reason. Now that would would take us back into chapter 2 and then chapter 3, but let's keep reading. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now as you look in this text, the Apostle Paul is laying out his prayer for the Ephesian church. And he starts with, for this reason, going back into chapter 2, where the work of Christ has brought together all, the, all of these different parts, these um, Gentiles and Jews, people from all sorts of different religious backgrounds and belief systems. And he's bringing them into this homogenous group and trying to bring unity to them. And this is the type of thing that needs the supernatural grace of God. And in light of that, Paul, as a missionary and apostle to the Gentiles, says, this is my prayer for you. And so the central theme of his prayer that we see in chapter 3 at the end here is is the love that he wants believers to understand and comprehend, this incomprehensible love of God. But that's not how he begins. He begins with an introduction. And so if, if you're following along, I've called it the foundation of hope. And so as we enter into prayer there are assumptions that we all have that maybe we're not even thinking of. And whether you have a good theology or a bad theology of prayer, if you're praying, it doesn't even matter if you're praying to the God of the Bible, if you're praying, you're assuming something something is happening. Whether it's a good work or whether you think God is hearing, you, you have assumptions that cause you to do this thing we call prayer. Paul wants us to buy into what the scripture tells us is true, and it's the foundation of his hope. And then he has the request proper in the second portion of the verse, starting in verse 16 down through verse 19. Let's call that the request for help. So there's a foundation of hope, then a request for hope, and he ends with this appeal that God would get honored through the answer to prayer. And so let's start here with uh, in verse 14 with this um, foundation for hope. It's what makes prayer have joy and expectation behind it. Well, here's what he says. He says, for this reason, that is the reason of the Ephesian need for love in the body. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, he starts there. And he says, this is his foundation for prayer. And he starts with the the way in which he comes before the Father. He says, I bow my knees. Now, that may not seem surprising to us, but it's actually a fairly uncommon way for a Jewish man to pray. In fact, if we're to look in the Gospels, in Jesus' public prayers, the expectation is he's standing. So when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he is standing, he's not bowing, he's actually looking up to heaven, Scripture says, and thanking the Father and blessing the food. Well, when you you consider what, what the natural expectation is and then recognize that he is saying, I am bowing my knee, he is driving us to see the attitude that should be there. It doesn't matter if you're standing or literally kneeling with a bowed um, posture. There's this understanding that coming into the presence of God through prayer requires that we come with respect and reverence and awe for the position of the one to whom we pray, the Father. In fact, this is probably taken from um, Isaiah 45. There are, there are three other citations in the whole entire New Testament of this idea of bowing before the Father. Two of them are quoting from Isaiah, and he seems to be referring to this concept. So let me just read Isaiah 45, because I think it pictures for us exactly what Paul is thinking of when he's praying. And so maybe as you picture yourself coming into prayer, you should literally, in your mind, imagine these things going on. That is, you're coming into the presence of God through prayer. And through in the spirit, and so in the spiritual presence, you're coming through 
to the God of gods. In Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23, Scripture records for us God declaring His, his godlihood. Verse 22, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. This is the passage that Paul cites in Romans, and again, he cites it in Philippians 2. This idea of bowing, everyone bowing. And so when Paul says, I come and I bow, and I'm doing this as I pray, he's picturing the God supreme, the one who declares and creates all things, the one who accomplishes everything with his word, the one that every creature in all of the world, in all of the universe, in all of time, that God to whom everything will bow is the one to whom he comes to in prayer. And that is something that should lead us to humble respect, but also hope. The one you're praying to is the God of creation. The one that will bring Satan to his knees. The one that enjoy every redeemed of all of the ages will bow and worship in the ages to come. The one who speaks and brings into existence all things. That's the God we pray to. But it's not just the God we pray to. It identifies him as the one we bow on our knees to. And then it identifies him as the Father. Now, why does he do this? Well, in fact, he's going to build a little bit of a theology of God's fatherhood for us in the following uh, phrases. But he says, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, he's using this because fathers are the ones that are generally in all of society given the duty of both protection and care. I think Jesus makes this point really clear in Matthew 7 where he compares the, the care of an earthly father And then he compares it to the care of the Father in heaven. And the comparison leads him to say, if you who are evil, now his point isn't they they have evil, but in contrast to the goodness of God, the most noble man is evil. But then he says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts, in verse 11, he says, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to them who ask? So the point of Paul here, I think, is similar in that when he calls on us to recognize that we bow before the God of the universe, the Lord Supreme, who belongs or who owns all glory, he's also our Father, and he cares, and he's in charge of our protection, and and he is the one who gives good things to his children. I want you to imagine for a minute... um, Going back, let's say, the 1950s in England, and a man, <clears throat> oh, let's just name him an important man. There's only about, uh, I think there's less than 30 dukes in all of England. And so imagine this duke trying to petition the queen for some type of political position or power or maybe some benefit of his. And, and he, he's bugging Queen Elizabeth II again and again and again. And after months of petitioning for, for uh, coming before the queen, finally he's admitted. And as he's going in, now, the person in charge of the queen's calendar says, you have five minutes, so speak quick. And man, after months of trying to get the queen's attention and finally given an, uh, an audience before the queen, he's, he's angry. He's been held off, and, and he thinks he should have a right to speak to the queen. And so he goes in, and with a little bit of frustration and a little bit of anger, he says, how, how is it that it took me so long to get to talk to you And now as I'm speaking to you, I'm given five minutes, 300 seconds to speak to you when every day since I began the petition, you have been meeting with the Duke of Cornwall. The queen looks at him and says, well, you've wasted a lot of your five minutes already, but you should know something. The Duke of Cornwall's name is Charles and he's my son. Now we would all expect the queen that she would spend time with her son. And and that's just the reality of of life is that kings grant their children special access. They love their children. They're welcomed into their presence all the time. When dignitaries and nobles and even foreign kings and queens would have to ask for permission and have to wait in line, children have an access like nobody else. And so we have 
God and everyone will bow before him because he is the supreme ruler and creator of all the universe. But for his children, there is granted a special provision of access through prayer to come to his presence, to come barging into the throne room and to come and say, Father, I have needs. Would you please listen? And God, who is the good father, who gives good gifts to his children when they ask him, bends down and listens. He might be king of the universe, but he has time for his children. Paul doesn't stop there. He continues teaching us about prayer. As he says, I bow my knees before the Father. And he says, from whom every family, every single family's idea, every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, as we pull this apart, notice that the, the location of in heaven and on earth drives us to two different types of families. There's a heavenly group of families and an earthly group of families. And I think from Ephesians, Paul has repeatedly brought our attention to the angelic world. In fact, if you go back to chapter uh, 3, verse 9, just, just a few verses back, you'll see that he is talking about God producing a work in the church that angelic um, witnesses see. And, and so I think if we come just a few verses later now in this prayer in verses 14 and 15, these families that, that we're speaking of aren't human families that are in heaven, but the angelic families. And so there's angelic units, and I think this would include both elect or righteous angels as well as the fallen angels. So these every family in heaven, and then he says every family on earth, that every single family unit derives its name from God. Now, this is, this is probably something that most of us miss because we could think of just the fatherhood of God here, but I think... I think there's more than just simply that he's the father. If we were to go to Psalm 45, let me make sure I get this reference right. I think it's Psalm 45. Um, scripture reminds us that every star has been created by him and every star has been given a name. And so think of this. If every family derives its name from the father, then every family has been named by him, and that's actually a declaration of ownership and sovereignty. Now, this would be a great comfort to the Ephesian church, who are told in chapter 6 that these angelic forces are opposed to them and a danger to them. And it's a reminder that the one to whom we pray, who calls us child, and we treat as father and approach with the hope that, like a father, he hears us and answers our prayers. He listens and he cares and he gives good things. That this, the one who is our father, is also the sovereign king over every fallen angel, every elect angel, every fallen human family, anyone who's against us and all those who are for us, all of them are under the kingship and sovereign rule of our Father. And so he says, I come in with an attitude of reverence and awe, kneeling in bowed posture spiritually before the Father. He's my Father, so I have every hope that the doors to his throne room will swing open wide and I can run in and get access, not only immediately, but access to one who cares about me. But he's not just my Father. He is the sovereign over all. All beings, all families, angels and people, all of them. He is the one who named them as a declaration of his kingship over them. And they all obey his will. That's my hope as I pray for you, the Ephesian church. Now, that's what Paul says. And I think we ought to just stop and, and rest for a moment. Because one of the things that I do often when I pray is I mindlessly start with words. In fact, maybe you've ever had this experience. I've done it one or two times, maybe a few more. But I started a prayer that has nothing to do with food, with something like, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Whoa, and I have got to stop right there. Have you ever done that? Where you have just run into the throne room of God without considering how much honor and respect He deserves. Without, without considering how much he cares 
And the fact is, you are not informing your God who cares about anything. He's your Father. He knows what you have need before you even ask it. So, so this is not an information meeting where I come to some bureaucrat who doesn't care. He's my Father. He doesn't need to be informed. I'm not giving him a shopping list that he doesn't know about. I'm speaking to the person of God with all respect and reverence because he cares, but he's also the sovereign ruler and Lord over every being. Perhaps the next time before you pray, you can preach to yourself and meditate a little bit before you enter into the throne room. I mean, I, I'm not big on the monarchy of England. I did your research to give you the illustration of the Prince of, or the Duke of Cornwall, because I didn't know that he was the Duke. I knew that he had a couple of dukedoms, but I, I'm not a big fan. But if I was granted access to any of the princes or the Queen of England, I would probably do a little bit of research. I'd probably be a little bit nervous. And I would be thoughtful about how I would speak and what, what I would talk about. How much more does God in heaven deserve the full confidence of his people that he cares and is powerful? How much more does the God of heaven deserve your respect as the king who deserves your reverence? So before you pray, preach to yourself and consider who God is. Consider that you are entering into the presence of the Almighty God who can answer your prayers, who cares, and who deserves your attention. And discipline your mind to enter with hope. Discipline your mind not to be distracted. Discipline your soul to go with the confidence that He asks you to go into His presence with in Hebrews chapter 4. That's the foundation of prayer. It's the foundation that gives us hope. And it leads the apostle to ask audacious things in the next section. So look with me in, in the following verses, in verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning that I'm going to cut this in half. And, and so think of this whole prayer a little bit like a, a, a cosmic prayer you. That is, we start in heaven with who God is, we come down, we enter into our need, and then we go back up and end with praying for God's honor. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're starting up here. The hope of prayer is who God is. The hope of prayer has nothing to do with us, right? I have nothing to contribute in terms of what I'm doing in prayer. In prayer, I come in and say, God, you got to do this thing because I can't. Okay, so we start with God and we come down into our need. And then the end, we remind ourselves again of who God is and why we actually should be praying these things. So what we're going to do this morning is just like the first half of, an, uh, of that you. We're starting in heaven. We're coming down into our need. Next week, we'll pick back up with our need and then end back in heaven. All right, so look down in verse 16 with me. He says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's an incredible prayer. And we're going to just go through the, the first portion of verse 17 this morning. So verses 16 through halfway through 17, if you're writing that down often, you'll note that with a, a and a B. So it's, it's 16 through 17a. And we're going to look at the request for help. And we're just looking at that first part of that request for help. But this is kind of the main body of his prayer. And here's how he begins, verse 16. That, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. Okay, so he begins his request by saying, I want God to do something in the Ephesians church. So this group of people in Ephesus need something to be accomplished. But the basis of his request... The, the, maybe we could say the account where the check is going to be written from is, is given in the first part of verse 16. So that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. Now, glory was a, a repeated theme in chapter 1. About five times in chapter 1, he says something like, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, or the praise of his glorious grace, or this glorious inheritance. In fact, he calls God the Father of glory, right? So we look in chapter 1, and there's this theme of glory that surfaces. Now we come to chapter 3, and it's according to the riches of this glory of God's. 
Now that glory is a reference to kind of the, the total of his attributes and power and characteristics. Maybe when you think of glory, there's, there's two ways I, I think are helpful to think of it biblically. One is the display of God's characteristics, but it's rooted in who God is. Maybe a little bit like the back of a baseball card with all these stats. You know, two-time MVP, you know, batting average of 350, 15-time All-Star. That's, that's a little card of glory. But those stats are a reflection of the real characteristics of the player. He was a skilled batter. He was a good fielder. He played for so many years. And in those years, he displayed these abilities because he had the abilities. All right, so glory is both the characteristics, the abilities of God, if we can use that phrase, like in a baseball player. It's those abilities, but it's also the, the display of them, the showing of them in the glorious light of God. Here, he's referring to the abilities themselves, the characteristics themselves. That is according to the ability of God. Now, what is God's ability? He's infinite. And so we have these omni words. He's omnipotent. Potent means powerful. He's all powerful. He's omnipresence. That is, he's er he's everywhere present with his whole being. We don't have a piece of God in this room. He is all here. And isn't that a comfort to know that even if you're watching this in your living room, God is present? He's not just that, he's omnisapient. That is, he's all wise. Now, how terrifying would it be if God was all powerful, but a clueless 14 year old boy? Can you imagine what the world would look like if God had the intelligence and the maturity of a 14 year old boy? Well, he doesn't, he's, he's all wise. He is good, he's righteous. All of these attributes coalesce into one essential characteristic of who God is. God is this, not in parts. He's, he doesn't have a holy arm and a loving arm and, and part of him is loving and part of him is holy. He is all of these things throughout all of his being. That's a, kind of the idea of simplicity. He is, his love is a holy love, which is also a righteous love, which means his justice is a loving, righteous, holy justice. And, and so they all are part of this single characteristic of what we would call his glory. This is who he is. And it is from this infinite supply of God's ability or his characteristics and attributes that Paul says, on the basis of this, God work. In fact, you look at the phrase he says, he says, according to the riches of your glory. Now, when you think of the riches of God's glory, consider how rich people are often still struggling with the same desires we have. And, and you can have someone who's rich who isn't very generous. So a man with millions of dollars can walk out of Walmart and feel like he's generous by only giving a dollar to a poor person. Now the picture here is God is immensely rich in glory, but that riches does us good. So he's not this Ebenezer Scrooge who's got piles of gold and can't hand out a penny. He's a God who, who is rich in glory, and then gives of that richness to his people. That is, he is filled with all of the godliness of God. And from that supply of power and grace and goodness, he pours into his people richly through the giving of strengthening power. Look at that next phrase here. He says that from this, he strengthens us with power. Now those phrases, strength and power, strength has the idea of, of building something up through labor and work. Very much like we would think of a weightlifter who goes to the gym and constantly works out so that he's building up. That's the idea of strengthening, but he's building up so that he can ultimately accomplish more, and that's power. That is, someone has the power, let's say, to lift 300 pounds. That's an expression of power. Strengthening then leading to power. These work together and from God's rich supply, he's granting us strengthening and power. Now notice, through what? Through the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is the agent who applies this work of God. The Father sends the Spirit as the agent who strengthens us so that we can do something that will come in verse 17 but notice where this power is applied 
It's to our inner being. This is not a common term. It's used in 2 Corinthians 4 where Paul speaks to the um, ability to withstand pressure. He, he identifies himself as a vessel that's weak and brittle, a clay pot. And this is so that the strength and the glory would be attributed to, not to the clay pot, but to the maker, God, who sustains and strengthens and upholds him in the middle of persecution. And then he says this, he says, So though our outward man is perishing, so he's dealing with persecutions and hardships and shipwrecks, imprisonment, abandonment by friends, things that would break the soul of a normal being. He's dealing with all of these things. He says our outward man is being pummeled and pressed and, and pushed on, and we're just a clay pot. He says our inward man is being renewed. That same concept is, is being given here, and that is there are all sorts of pressures pressing on the Ephesian church, leading them to break. Well, what is their hope? It is the Almighty God of Heaven who is their Father, supplying what only He can supply. Strength and power, where? In the inner person. The agent is the Holy Spirit Himself, the God of gods. In His triune grace, the Father sends the Spirit who is present within us to strengthen our inner being. Now, if we just take a moment and reflect on this, isn't our sin something that comes up from within us, not external? I mean, it's often expressed externally. So something happens and you get angry and you say it with words. But what's angry? It's your inner being. It's your emotions and your, your will and your thoughts. And all of these things lead us internally to express it externally. So whether it's the sins of lust or anger or complaint or bitterness, whether it's the social sins of unkindness or ungraciousness or lack of love towards others, these sins are sins that find their source within. And so this is what Paul prays for. He doesn't pray, Father, please help them not to say angry words. He says, Father, send your spirit to strengthen them in their inner being. That's, that's the source and the root, I would say, of both Christian virtue and hellish sin, the inner being. And this is where the battle really is being waged. But he doesn't stop there. The Holy Spirit gives strength in the inner being. Here's the result then in verse 17. So that, that's a result word, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now we're going to stop here, but I want to explain this phrase and, and then kind of finish up for this morning and then we'll pick up right here next week and, and continue on through verse 17 into 18. He's, he's praying that God strengthens according to the riches of His glory through the Holy Spirit in our inner person with a result. So pay attention. This is why Paul is praying for this rich supply out of God's glory to bring strength through the Spirit so that what Christ dwells in our hearts. Now, think about what is being said here because this is one of those phrases where we clearly see the divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is both human and divine. He is this, this both fully God, fully man person. And now we're focusing on his divine nature because the human nature couldn't indwell another human. But the divine nature comes and dwells within the believer. Now the point is, is this is not camping. This is not a little quick trip where Jesus sets up a tent and then leaves and can't wait to get back home to heaven and get rid of the tent so he can get air conditioning and climate control and have a refrigerator. No, the point is, is he comes into the believer and makes his permanent residence in them. Now, again, picture the Trinity here. The Father sends the Spirit so that the Son can dwell in our hearts. And again, heart would be, should be that inner person. So this work of God to strengthen us through the Holy Spirit leads to the Son of God making you his happy home. Now the point would be that he actually sets you up as a place where he is comfortable to dwell. That, that he has shaped your inner being to be like him. We might use the word Christ-like. 
What becomes Christ-like? Your heart. This is where He dwells, your inner being, your thoughts and your affections, the way you respond to circumstances, the way you view the world around you gets reshaped so that it's comfortable for Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I do not mean any disrespect, but it's like getting a new pair of, of shoes or jeans or new furniture. It doesn't fit. And then after you've had it for a while, it just like molds to you and it's comfortable. And Christ is coming into the believer and through this strengthening work of God via the Holy Spirit, he makes the believer that comfortable place for the Son. And what happens is not the Son changes. Obviously, the Son of God never changes. What is happening through the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit is we are changed. This transformational process is something I think you see at least indicated in chapter 5, where he says, don't be drunk with wine but be controlled by the Spirit. And then it speaks in the next verse of this Christ-likeness coming out of us in the assembly. So we have the Holy Spirit working within us in chapter 518. So if we're just to turn there and read it quickly, here's what Scripture says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit. The point in, in verse 18 is not the Spirit comes in us, but that is through the agency of the Spirit that we are filled with the character of Christ. And that's why we get in verse 19, the Lord ruling in our hearts, so that Christ is honored in verse 20. Now, coming back to chapter 3. The point of this is, the apostle wants to see the Ephesian church have the very character of Christ where Christ is their home. And all of, the, all of the attention is focused on God so far until that last little word in verse 17. Um, God, out of the rich supply of His glory, strengthens us and powers us through the Holy Spirit in our inner being so that Christ dwells in our hearts through... Do you notice this? Through what? Through faith. So Paul is not just praying for God to work, he's praying that God's work would also have a responsiveness in the people. That is, as God works, God is also energizing and strengthening them to trust in Him. And there is somewhat of a divine mystery here, isn't there? That is, we know that God is the author of faith according to Hebrews. Or if we just go back to Ephesians chapter 2, that this work of God is a work of grace that we are gifted saving faith. But we still have faith. Faith is ours. Luther calls this the praise of faith. And you know what? I think it's Calvin that calls it that. It's one of those great reformers. But I'm going to stick with Luther on this one. I think my first guess was right. That He calls this the praise of faith. And here's his point. How important is faith here? That faith is the mechanism by which the Son of God is given freedom in the human heart to make it comfortable for Him. That's an amazing thought. How important it is that we be people who respond to the Word of God and the work of God with a steadfast confidence in the revealed truth of God. That we respond with faith that as Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, the means of, of Him setting up a comfortable place is through faith. And so let us not diminish how important it is that as we are praying for this for one another, we're not just praying for God to do a work on His own and the person is entirely passive. That is, as God works, we're also praying the person responds in faith to Scripture. And so if you're, if you're interacting with this on a personal level and you're thinking, I should pray this for myself, one of the things that you can do to equip yourself to respond in faith is be a person of the Word of God. Know what God says and respond by affirming it. This is true. I need to believe this. I need to trust God that this is the right way to respond. I need to believe that lying or anger or unkindness, that laziness and other things are, are the wrong way for me to engage life. And there's a response of faith to God's revealed word. There is a response of faith to God's goodness. God is a God who is patient and long-suffering. Do you believe that that's good? Or do you believe that's good for God, but not good for you? Genuine faith permeates the whole being so that not only do we say it's good for God to be patient with me, and therefore, here's where faith comes in, it is good for me to be patient with others. I can tell you just saying that sentence, I will need God's strength. 
to live that out. So I must know what God says and believe it. And then as I do that, God gives strength through his spirit so that Christ becomes an indwelling, comfortable presence. Because if he's indwelling and I am not looking like Christ, that is an uncomfortable presence. I don't think it'd be wrong for us to say, because Ephesians says it, that the Holy Spirit is grieved by some of us when we sin. I think the point of this passage is then that the Holy Spirit makes us to be a place, the result being Christ dwells comfortably in our hearts as we respond in faith. So this is just the beginning of his prayer. So we started with hope. What's the hope? It's the God he prays to is actually the sovereign of the universe. So he enters with reverence and awe and respect, knowing that he has access because he's father. There's hope because he's sovereign. The content of the prayer then, or the request for help that we discussed this morning, is this request that God would have his work in us according to the rich supply of his glory to to strengthen and empower us through the working of the Holy Spirit within us so that it accomplishes this result. We become Christ-like as we believe the revealed word of God. Let's pray for each other this week. Let's pray for ourselves and our children Let's pray for things beyond the characteristics of godliness in this passage, things like God's providential care for our country. Let's pray in this election year for leaders that will release Christians to be more free to walk in godliness and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for the advance of missions among the nations. But let's start with this thought. There is a foundation for hope. It's the one we pray to. His power his affection for me, his position as sovereign father who who names every family in heaven and on earth. And let us also pray with the hope that God is doing something within us and the entire Trinity, all three persons, the Father sending the Spirit to make things in our lives comfortable for the Son so that we look like Jesus Christ. Let us pray that God has his full work in each of his people. Would you pray with me as we close this morning that God would do this work? Father, we come before you as the holy God of the universe, the one who is sovereign over all things. And we just simply ask and request that according to the rich glory of your person, you would make the people of Crossway and the people of of your son throughout this world strong through the Holy Spirit so that Christ may dwell in them and they may look like him through faith. In Jesus' name, amen.